Business analytics is a new discipline for us at Deakin, and for us to be able to partner with IBM, who are one of the biggest players in business analytics, is fantastic. But to anybody who's starting, I would say, you know, do what you love. Find something that, you know, is going to be re really interesting because, you know, you're working for a long time. And, uh, and, and right now, business analytics is a very, very interesting place to work. So why not try it? Is it a big deal? Yes. Why? For those two reasons. One is that really it cements the positioning of the School of Information Systems in the area of analytics. And two, it celebrates our industry focus with a really good partner. I'm Colin Shearer from IBM. I'm a global executive in charge of advanced analytics solutions. And I would just like to say how excited I am working with Deakin on this partnership. I think it's very significant for us. It's very significant for Deakin. And most importantly, it's very significant for the students and for the businesses they will work with to bring business analytics uh, to another level. So thank you very much indeed for working with us and collaborating like this. Good afternoon, everybody, and, and I'm just saying I'm so glad to be here. I'm so thrilled at our collaboration. Um, thank you for trusting me with the sharp objects outside. That's appreciated. And you noticed with predictive analytics, the first demonstration of this in the center of excellence, this door is predicting when any of you are thinking of making a run for it, basically, and getting out of here, and, and that hence the alarm going off. What I'm going to do this afternoon is talk to you at, at hopefully not at too, too much length. I'm, I'm known to talk a little bit, but I want to talk about predictive analytics. I want to give you some context as to why it's so, so important. I want to give you a broad idea of why people get excited about it, what they do with it, the way it's used in different industries. And then I thought I would talk a little bit because we, this is something that is moving forward, is rolling forward very quickly. And I think this, you know, the, the coming into being of the center of excellence reflects this. It's becoming more and more important. I want to talk about how it's evolved, how it's matured, where it is now and where it's going. So. Without more ado, analytics, why are we here? Because analytics has gone from being something that technical people do in a sort of geeky way to being a competitive necessity. This is just a nice indication from MIT about the evolution uh, of, of, that you can tell, you know, the, how important this has become is from 2010, when 37% of organizations were saying they were realizing competitive advantage, to last year 63%. And that really is quite a phenomenal increase. However, while all that sounds wonderful, this huge mass of data that is coming at us, this tsunami of data that is coming at us, uh, brings with it a set of problems. So as we face the, the volume, the variety, the velocity of data that we have to deal with, we have the challenges of organizations putting it to use. And as it says here, if you can read that, one in three managers are saying that they are home to making decisions when they know they don't have the right information to base on. They, they can't know it's the right decision. Half of them don't have inefficient access to the information they need to make those decisions and do their jobs. And three out of four business leaders say they could do their business better if only they could look forward. And this just bears that out. This is when IBM does a study, when we do a survey of organizations across industries, we're always looking for differences. We're always trying to say, what distinguishes those who really overperform in their industry versus the, the ones who have sort of run of the mill performance? And one of the key differentiators you can see here is that organizations at the, at the peak of their industry, the most successful ones, are 15 times more likely to be using predictive techniques, to be taking a forward-looking approach to their business. So what is this predictive analytics about? In traditional analytics, you're looking at the past. You're looking at a slice of time and the data that reflects that time up to and including now. And you can get useful information, very useful information and insights from that. You can get all sorts of metrics and measures. You can see these things like KPIs on your dashboards, and you can see something of interest, and you can drill down into it. But you take the initiative. Now, in predictive analytics, we start with the same data. We start with the same history of what's been happening. But this time, instead of us probing at the interesting things manually, we send algorithms into the data to find out what's going on. Now, no matter what you hear about you know, big data and you go and explore and discover stuff, you do not simply send algorithms in to find interesting things at random. They go in looking for a particular outcome. 
or things to do with a particular outcome. That outcome might be whether or not a transaction was fraudulent, whether or not somebody responded to a marketing offer when it was made, whether a telco customer left and defected to a competitor or something like that. And what these algorithms do is they find the underlying patterns, the profiles, the connections that are often too subtle to be spotted by eye, okay, that go along with those outcomes. So this gives us, with this being the business analytics center of excellence, this gives us a whole spectrum of capabilities from, predict from traditional business intelligence through predictive analytics. This is from a 2003 survey by IDC. It was when the term predictive analytics first really came into common use. And they went out and they talked to lots of organizations in many industries who've done analytics projects. And they studied the ROI they got. Now the good news is that all of them found a strong positive ROI. But for the traditional analytics, like business intelligence, they found an ROI of, on average, 89%. For every dollar spent, $1.89 returned. For predictive analytics, that rose to an average of 145%. Now, why am I showing you this from 10 years ago? Because 18 months ago, they reran the survey. And they found that they were still seeing, on average, an 89% um, re return on investment for traditional projects. But with predictive analytics, it had gone up to 250%. Why such a difference? Okay. It's because in traditional analytics, you're typically making the measurable gains from efficiency. Okay. You're getting the information into the, into, onto the desktops, into the minds of the decision makers, more efficiently, faster, more cheaper. That's what you can measure. You can't so easily measure what they do with it. With predictive analytics, as you'll hear, the outcomes, the analyses, are much more linked to the decisions that drive actions, that drive re the return on investment. So we can measure that, and it usually is very dramatic. Apart from customers, in organizations, you also see the use of predictive analytics for operations. And I'll give you a couple more examples of this later, but this is when you're trying to do things more efficiently and more effectively. And one of the really burgeoning areas of this is what we call predictive maintenance. Now, think for a moment about anything that's to do with you know, mechanical things or engineering or devices, anything to do with these assets, and how they're maintained. They break and you fix it. Or if you're really sophisticated, you, know, you work out that things like this break every 10,227 hours and you fix it 200 hours earlier or whatever it is. But that, even that approach is a fairly simplistic view. It's saying that all sorts of things of that type fail the same way, like a helicopter rotor or something like that. And then you've got risk and fraud. Okay. How do you reduce the incidence of you know, fraud, waste, and abuse, as we refer to it? And there are many, many examples of this. And you're trying to take, a, take masses of transactions often, and you're trying to work out where are those dangerous needles in the haystack. And often this is a question of efficient use of resources as well as saving the public money. You have a finite number of people to scrutinize. Where do you look at these transactions? You, know, you go back 20 years, and it was all about the algorithms. And you would maybe say you'd have systems for rule induction, for neural networks, things that could automatically find clusters and segments in data, you'd regression support and vector machines. Believe me, more algorithms than you could shake a stick at in here. And everyone was looking for the silver bullet. Now, does the name Ross Quinlan mean anything to anyone here? Yeah? University of New South Wales. He is a, the man is a legend. Um, Ross is, he invented one of these rule induction and decision tree systems. He's actually invented several. But you know, he's, he's inspired a generation by producing one of the basic algorithms, I'd probably say basic, a very powerful fundamental algorithm used in, in these things. But the reason I bring that up is this is how the business world used to look for data mining back in the early 90s. You would take his algorithm C4.5. You would take a standard decision, a standard data set, which was very boring data about telling different types of iris plant apart. You would build your own amazing algorithm, which could beat C4.5 by 2%, and you would go seeking venture capital to do that. And that was how it was. It was taking off. It was like our own little dot-com boom in analytics. Everyone was trying to say, we've got the next best algorithm. Fund us, fund us for this. And you know, the number of little organizers that started up and crashed and burned was phenomenal at that time. Right? And there is no silver bullet. There is no algorithm that's going to transform the world. If there's anything we've learned from that time, it's that you cannot predict in advance, no matter how good your individual algorithm, that it will be the one that will succeed in this case with this data in these situations. Okay. So instead, we began to see the emergence of focus on the process, on how you do this, how you take the algorithms you've got, and how you apply them. 
And that led to two things. It led to the emergence of tools, and this, what you see here, is actually the predecessor of the current <coughs> IBM SPSS modeler, but where instead of getting down and working with an individual algorithm and hand configuring the code and so on, you work at the high level and specify the analytical tasks and the flow of it. And what you're doing here is working through a process. And so in the mid-1990s, 1996 to 98, um, with funding from the European Union, uh, my organization and several others uh, collaborated and produced what was called CRISP-DM, which is the cross-industry standard process for data mining, which basically spells out a set of steps, you know, how you do these things, how you first of all analyze the business problem. You then say what data is associated with that. You then prepare the data for analysis, you analyze it, and you see if you've met your business goals or not, and then you deploy it and put it to use. And this became a sort of de facto standard, really, in the industry. But you can see the change here. The individual technology is less important than how you apply the analytics to get to a particular task. You can collect the most wonderful, perfect view of the data. You can build predictive models, and you can increase their accuracy and fine-tune them until you are blue in the face. Until you do something with the results, you're not actually generating value. Here's a list of where, usually in an organization using advanced analytics, the analysts spend their time. These are the tasks they do, okay? They look at new ways to apply this in the business. They repeat data preparation. They monitor the performance of existing models. They update and refresh the models. They explore new ways of doing it, and they build new models. And you can see out of that, there are some of these you really want them to be doing. This is where an organization gets value, from being able to tackle new projects and get better and better and better at applying analytics. You know what? This is where they have to spend the time. Then we've got the challenge of deployment. And deployment just means, as I said, it's, do, it's turning into action. It's doing something with the results of analysis. And there's a whole range of deployment options. There's everything from what you might call ad hoc discovery, where you sit down and you try and find things. That can be actually, you know, I've been dealing recently with companies in, in areas like manufacturing, uh, where you manufacture a batch of steel or something, and you, get, you begin to get issues from when it's used in the field, and you dive into all the detail about that, and you find the, the relevant facts in it. Then you've got you know, visualization and reporting, trying to get the information out of the data and circulate it to the people who need to consume it. You've got the idea of scoring, of taking predictive models and applying it to new cases, like in the telco example, all of our subscribers on a regular basis. And maybe you do it manually, maybe bring it to me, we score them, we put it back in the database, or you automate that. It becomes part of your production processes. But then you also have the ability to put the decision wherever it needs to be made. So you're automating decisions in the front line, either putting them on, their, on the front line on their own, these predictive models, or indeed going further and having the system to go from the model's prediction, 0.873 probability of churning or something like that, to a decision, which is the right thing to do, which combines business logic with the models and says, actually, he's not worth keeping. No offense, Alan. Or, you know, he's worth keeping, give him a gold-plated phone or something like this, and so on, make the right decision. But the point I'm making here is, as you go across from left to right, I'm not saying one of these is right or one is wrong for any situation. The further you go to right, the greater the value potential, but also the greater the demand, the greater the necessity to integrate these analytical models with the operational processes and the systems that support them. So what are we doing when we deploy predictive analytics into a process? We are making a smarter decision at that point, and we're tipping the balance of probabilities in favor of there being more positive outcomes and less negative ones.